Visionary is proud to present his 21st season on public television. Sometimes you read the paper and watch the news, and it seems like there's more bad news than good in the world. But you know what? It's just not true. I at least can hold on to something, that there's something, that it, maybe it's small, but there's something that I'm doing to make a difference. It's just a feeling that you have. You can help people. You have to. There's no alternative. Every child has potential that we just can't know. And so to my mind, that's what we're doing. We are saving potential for the future. A hundred years ago, a group known today as the National Cooperative Business Association, CLUSA, was formed as a vessel to hold and promote the stuff out of which cooperation is made. We go to Mozambique now to demonstrate how the cooperative model is not just people working side by side, it is often about forging the links in an interlocking chain. CLUSA is the international arm of the National Cooperative Business Association. It is a vital part of a global movement guiding us toward a future where communities have the tools to solve their challenges. So I get asked a lot, what is CLUSA? Well, the Cooperative League of the USA. We were founded 100 years ago. We're celebrating our 100th anniversary. And it was known at that time in 1916 as the Cooperative League of the USA. We're an international NGO. We're focused on sustainable agriculture, food security and nutrition, natural resources management. I think the thing that really strikes me about CLUSA is the work that we've done over 62 years really at the community level and focusing on how to build capacity of countries like here in Mozambique. Here we are in the office of the Mozambican Association to promote modern cooperatives, which is an association which was created in 2010, trying to aggregate more and more groups working co-op and pro-cooperative association. We all want to feel a part of a community. So cooperatives and enterprises are fairly unique in that if you try to serve people in that mission, you create community and community is a good environment in which people can thrive and feel that attached and that they belong to something bigger than themselves. One of the organizations which had a big role in all this was CLUSA. CLUSA was from the beginning with us. What we do is we, really, we tap into the com existing community resources and we build on that. Giving people the tools and the knowledge mm -hmm. is really what's the most powerful and what sets us apart from humanitarian approaches. So we don't come with solutions from outside and impose um, projects and, and, and approaches to them. We build on what they have on the ground. They bring us people with experience, not only from the United States, but for, from other countries with experience on new model of co-ops. What's great about the cooperative model is it helps us aggregate farmers into associations and into cooperatives to give them more power and more voice. Mozambique have uh, a lot of resources, but they really need to know how to use them more. For instance, in agriculture, there's a big potential for developing the industry, but uh, there's a lack of capacity and resources and also of, uh, knowledge of different techniques. We talk a lot about you know, globalization and globalized markets. And if we don't find a way to bring those smallholder farmers and those marginalized groups into global markets, they're going to be left behind. It is not enough for a farmer to acquire better skills if she does not have good seeds to plant or a market to sell her crop. Only then can she buy medicine for her family or send her children to school. Yes. The seed itself, by improving it, we would be able to give them a better yield advantage and a better grain recovery at the end of the day. I'd like to show you some of the crop that we're producing this year. 
It's actually quite an interesting question when you say, what is seed? When we produce seed, we have a mechanical grader which will remove anything under eight millimeters in diameter. So the bigger your seed, the more of, a, of an energy bank you have for the seed. The farmers currently are getting about 700 kgs to 500 kgs a hectare. But this seed, because it's got more vigor within the grain, is going to give him at least a ton plus, maybe two tons a hectare, in the same conditions that he's currently farming at. So Carolina, can you give me kind of a thumbnail sketch of the project? Well, Promac, we're working in three provinces in the north and center of Mozambique, Tech, Manica, and Zambezia. We're working with 27,000 farmers, teaching them conservation agriculture practices, um, as well as supporting them in acquiring their land titles. So this project encompasses a bunch of different things. There's uh, land ownership, Yes. And we assist with that. There is the extension. improved seed, um, extension. the extension right. farmers, uh, conservation agriculture to help mm -hmm. produce larger yields, and gender empowerment by trying to focus on uh, providing women with the, with the, the ability to own those, that piece of land. Yeah. The objective is to mm -hmm. let farmers all, uh, use their land in a responsible manner mm -hmm. to look their, for their future. Yeah. We're going to visit one of our lead farmers on her demonstration plot. On uh, her demonstration plot, she's showing the difference between conservation agriculture and traditional agriculture practices. And some of the small holders that she supports will be there as well. Bon dia. So the techniques are continuous mulching. So they just cut the grass and leave it there? Just that. Yeah. Simple. Oh, that simple thing. Okay. The minimum so soil disturbance and then crop rotation. Yeah. So this technique is, is geared for a smallholder farmer. Exactly. Yeah. Um, to be able to get the most that they can out of the land that they have. <laughs> so this is the demonstration plot where we are learning the new pr um, production techniques. Okay. Okay. The first thing that they're learning is that they shouldn't burn in the surrounding area. Okay. That the grass that is around should be cut and placed on top of the plots in order to protect the, the, the soil. And it prevents weeds from growing on the plot. Are you getting more? The results of the campaign were good. The results of the campaign were good. The results of the campaign were good. The results of the campaign this is the first visible result. This is the moisture on, of the covered soil. It's much more um, evident. And the, there is no moisture in the soil that's not covered. This is very dry. It's very dry. One of the things that the lessons learned from practicing for two campaigns is that their labor that they need to prepare the soil and, and to do this practice is a lot lower. Okay. So the reduction in time means that they have more time to spend with their kids, to cook, to clean the house, and do other chores. Have you had more production on this plot? So this maize, we can compare to the maize on that side there. The plot with them with conservation agriculture, they got two bags, 50 kg bags last year. 70 kg more. Wow, you get much more production this year and you are able to sell some on the market. What will you do with your extra money? Mm -hmm. Buy more friends. food, books, su school supplies for your mm -hmm. children. Yeah, that's very good. Using our experience, one, two seasons, we started with Proma. 50% increase, it's, mm -hmm. it's reasonable to 40% expect. increase yeah. over what the traditional farming techniques exactly. would do. Yeah. That's amazing. That's, like, that's life-changing for, for a farmer. It is, yeah. yeah. It is, yeah. Just using the, the conservation agriculture practices, you can see a significant difference between this one and the very first plot yeah. that we saw there. Absolutely. I mean, this is the difference right here. So it's really just incredible to see the difference between the conservation ag plots and the conventional plots. It's, it's really visible. Yeah. It's really, really visible. It's great. But I think it's also important to note that these farmers also have the ability to then 
uh, self-govern and to form uh, clubs uh, and different groups that can help them to do various, various different things. And that's kind of the beauty of the co-op model. Bon dia a todos. So this group was started in 2012 and uh, farmers are getting support from us in learning conservation agriculture techniques and they're also linked to a bigger co-op where they aggregate the production here and then aggregate the production with the production of the members of the co-op and access a bigger market. A great example of farmers coming together and working together to get better prices, to put their product together so that they can access the markets. It's a really good example. We are now in the seed factory. It's the end of the season for us. We have pretty much sold most of the product that we've got on hand. So for us, it's been a reasonable season. And all thanks to our public-private partnership with Clusa, who helped us sell a large volume of seed. That kind of partnership is really what creates sustainability in the community. So going all the way back to the inception of the seed and how important that is, and be able to provide the good quality seed, that whole process then is not done by the NGO community. It's done by the, a private company owned and operated by a private individual. The relationship then is able to provide jobs for so the folks that are in the community. Uh, it's able to provide great product for the individuals to use, the, you know, the farmers to use, so that when Kusa moves on to another project or works on other things, that community can still thrive and still be resilient. In the group communications that we have in farmer development, farmer field days, Clusa, other facets of Clusa, like the uh, adult literacy and, 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 and AIDS awareness uh, teachings, can be held on the same ground and it, 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 we're sharing those costs and that for us is a, we believe is, is just how advantageous you, you have this um, building uh, engine that keeps moving forward. We are at one of our adult literacy centers and this center has 35 members that come here three times a week to get literacy courses so they're learning how to read and write and they're also learning about nutrition. Countrywide we have just about 15,000 participants in our literacy program. We're also teaching theory on conservation agriculture at these centers. It's such a critical component to producers, not just learning conservation farming, but really learning the fundamentals that are going to make them successful. I, I love the fact that you mentioned that because you know, that literacy is a very important part of making this thing work. Without a doubt. Amelia. Amelia is writing her name. And uh, being able to have those components built into this project uh, with your support has been fantastic. The key to our program is community empowerment. So aggregation is not just for the purposes of market access, but also giving people the tools so that they can gain information and make decisions based on the information that's available to them. And reading and writing are very, very basic and important skills that can make the difference in, in when people are participating in the marketplace. It's just going to put, put an advantage to us as a seed producer that that literacy is going to come into better comprehension and better a adaptation of our methods and so forth. Well, we ultimately believe it will be the profitability of the farmers at the end of the line because that's who we're focusing on. Right. We, we want to sustain our own business, but we want to make sure that the farmers are going forward because if they're going yeah, forward, so we're going forward and that's yeah. where we get the win. Absolutely. Muito bem. This is an extraordinary story that speaks to the very heart of the cooperative concept. That profit shared by the members can change the entire community. In East Timor, the largest provider of health care is a coffee growers co-op whose organic fair trade beans are a staple of Starbucks and thousands of other shops around the world. How do we address the challenge of letting folks back home understand and see what we're doing here. I just wish everyone could come and see it. There's such an incredible story that uh, we have to tell. We have 
22,000 very small farmers creating some of the world's finest and most expensive coffee, going into over 30,000 cafes worldwide. So the other part of it is the certifications, the ethical certifications being organically grown, being fair trade certified, being cafe farmer and equity practice certified. So tell me about this equipment. What's the significance of it? CCT has been able to procure and install state-of-the-art environmentally appropriate machinery that is able to process the coffee not only very efficiently but using very little water so there's almost zero waste and the yields and the quality of the coffees are also gone up. I think we need to share when we first got here in 1994 what it was like with the coffee growers and how is it now? The first year we produced about 40,000 pounds of coffee. We sent it to the United States as samples and uh, they characterized the quality of our cup as tasting like motor oil. So it's, it's taken a lot to go from motor oil to some of the best tasting coffee in the world. The best part of the story is that this is a cooperative. It's not just about individual coffee farmers. It's about farmers coming together, working together, um, using better practices to be able to impact the broader community in education and health. The impact of this project is enormous in this country. We consider CCT the largest private sector employer in the country. You're empowering them to run their own lives, their own economic lives, their own family lives. Well, because it's a cooperative, uh, as they accrue profits, they vote on how these, uh, how these profits should be allocated to their social well-being. Um, I mean, He's also as a farmer before. Just uh, since now, he, he has a position in the board of CCT. He feels that he has obligation to pay attention, like to look after the farmers. So it's like to help them. That's the best part of the story because yeah. they're able to produce such high coffee, sell it at such high prices. They're able to accrue significant profits, and fortunately, the cooperative every year votes to use these profits for their health care and their education programs. Uh, they're able to now provide health care for over 20,000 families in the area. We are doing mobile clinic here. 1,600 population with 260 household. Here, the closest government clinic is about a three hour walk. So this is the only medical service that these guys um, get to access once a week. So every week we have to come here with the truck, with the nurse and the midwife. And then the main services here is general practices and the services for maternal and child. For example, for the pregnant ladies and also for the child who has to be immunized and we weigh them and also some screening for their malnutrition. We've got uh, seven fixed clinics that we have um, scattered through the mountains uh, in, Amer in about three or four uh, rural districts and from each of those fixed clinics we run mobile clinics out to the, the more remote areas. We have 26 sites for all the services for mobile clinic. We treat 5,000 patients in this place. The program is completely managed by uh, Team Marie's staff. As a health manager, I have to make sure that all the services based on our plan is running well here. So for example, there are school kids here. They will uh, have the school screening for their dental. The main running of the health program is by the revenues from the coffee sales from the cooperative. It's, it's plowed back into the health service as a benefit for everybody in the community because we don't restrict access to the health service. It's available to everybody who comes along. For clinical services, 75% is from coffee revenue, all the clinical services. We also get assistance from the Timorese government. Uh, we get our medicines and uh, consumables uh, for free from the government. So it's a, it's a mix of uh, cooperative money, government money and donor money that keeps us going. Back about 10 years ago, there were several issues. Farmers' children did not want to be coffee farmers because they viewed their parents as being low-income people without a future. Education is one of the seven principles of cooperatives that we form ourselves on. To be informed owners of a business, to be informed in voting for the interests of the business, but also to use that education to help others become empowered and own their own co-op. 
So there was a, there was a horrible problem with urban migration. Everybody was floating into the city and that's where they had their dreams. And there was also no agricultural institutes in the country. So we wanted the farmers' children to stay close to their farms to learn how to make money on their farm farms. So you're teaching them how to farm as a business. You're teaching mm -hmm. farm management and farming techniques for better quality coffee. We've got over 3,000 people that have come and graduated from the school. And most of them we find now are staying on the farm and improving the profitability and productivity of their farms. The United States is very proud of the long-term investment in this project, and we have looked at it as a model going forward. The most recent project uh, NCBA and CCT have undertaken uh, has been to grow crops in the extreme east of, of the country. Uh, this is my village. Uh, I was grown here, and more, more than 100,000 uh, agri. So you've got this unbelievable huge potential. All of this empty land, all of these families that can farm, they're willing to farm, but they never have. This land for perhaps thousands of years uh, with all this potential has only been historically used for raising cattle and horses. It's only been pastoral and obviously farmers cannot get much income off that. So the farmers were frustrated that, uh, that the cattle would be roaming wild, would eat their crops, and obviously a simple solution was building fences. They begin with uh, fencing. That's uh, the first uh, step. And after the fence are already built, and they convince that cattle cannot go through, uh, they begin to farming. Gone through this great effort now of building these fences by hand, of plowing this land by hand. So it seems they're really willing to do a lot of hard work to try this out. Yeah, I think it's a potential to get money from the land. Do you think in 10 or 15 years we'll see all of this planted in cassava yes, believe, and pepper and cloves and coffee and cocoa? I believe that after 10 years, all land is can use to plant crop. This is Augustina. She's 25 years old. She's got four children here in Los Palos in East Timor. Um, Augustina is part of our project here, working with USDA, and the project is focusing in this case on vanilla as part of our diversification work. The idea here is that Augustina is going to start vanilla plants, cultivating them for a period of time, and then distributing them out to 300 farmers in this area who will then take those plantings, plant their own crops, and then be able to cultivate those. Vanilla is an extremely high value crop, so introducing this in the area here is going to impact the farmers and the community here in terms of income in a major way. They both of our brothers uh, work together and they grow several crops in the seas at the same time to reduce the risk of, of farming. The other, the other part of the equation was they had no, uh, no really viable planting material that, uh, that was adaptable to their, their soil and uh, their climatic conditions. So our USDA project brought that to them. Uh, one of crop is uh, maize or corn, and the second is a cassava. It's very fortunately one of the easiest things to grow. So you bring in a stem from a plant that's recently harvested, you uh, chop it up. Uh, in one stem you can uh, get a minimum of five viable plants resistant to, uh, to issues with climate change, which are becoming a great factor here. So uh, if there's a lot of rain, it's no problem. If there's no rain, it's no problem. A very exciting prospect is new technology where you can turn cassava flour into modified cassava flour and you can make a lot of very good food products out of it. You can, uh, you can turn it into breads, cakes, cookies. Tell us about your experience growing cassava. Uh, There's so many things you can do with it, uh, but it's new technology and CCT has been experimenting with it. The main reason is not to do something cutting edge or innovative. The main reason is so that the farmers can get almost double the return. So if CCT can value it at that phase, they can pay the farmers more than double than they would in the traditional market. Uh, before program, they just subsistent. They consume uh, all the, their harvest, and the rest will be uh, go to feeding the animal. Tiga juta, tiga juta. Okay. He he get uh, more than three hundred uh, US dollar. 
last year by uh, selling the dry slate cassava. Which is uh, only a part of the area he dedicated to the farm, and he got $350, which is the most money he had, he had ever seen. Uh, one of our uh, farmer cooperate have more than 2,000 US dollars. So you uh, sell your cassava to the cooperative, to CCT, right? CCT? Yeah, jadi to bocil fang, I free money, but CCT. So now you're members of a cooperative. Yeah, jadi agori to bocil member. That's the dream to integrate the whole system. So you've got the, a woman's group growing it, selling it to the cooperative, the cooperative turning it into a value product that they can turn into food and make additional money off it. So have you been making money off the cassava? Has it been successful for you in terms of your household income? Very good for them because it's really helpful. They can send the children to school and also help them. Uh, they're packaging it into uh, 10 kilo and 25 kilo sacks. Uh, we were very gratified to see that it's made it out all the way to Los Palos to uh, this woman's uh, cassava growers group who are now assisted to make uh, cookies and put them into the marketplace. So, in addition to growing the cassava, you're also using the flour to bake things. Tell us about that. And how does the cooperative benefit you to be a member of the cooperative here? She said that uh, the benefit that they get from member of cooperatives, it's really helped them to give them a good nutrition and also for their own children can help uh, making their life better. So it's, it's, it comes full circle. Those are the ones I want to clone. I want to clone those uh, seven or eight women over there and uh, create a thousand of them. Oh, different colors, they're all the same inside. I really like this box. I think, um, I think my children would like to eat these goodies. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to take all of them. <laughs> okay. mm. Those are delicious. Very delicious. Yeah. <laughs> For the visionaries, I'm Sam Waterston. Visionaries is brought to you through the generosity of the Anna Maria and Stephen Callan Foundation, CoBank, the Catholic Communication Campaign, National Cooperative Bank, the Community Foundation of Eastern Connecticut, and Eco Serendi Villa and Spa of St. John, and also by Capital Impact Partners, City Foundation, HG Promise Foundation, and PNC Bank. Additional support was provided by the following.